Many thanks, Trevor, and it's great to be here today. I think the idea of Research Fest is a really exciting one, and uh, I think it's wonderful that the ANU has, has launched this initiative. Well, Trevor sort of gave us, as you've probably been told, those of you who've attended earlier lectures, sort of marching orders, not to try and talk about our own experience as graduate students, but to really try and focus on a topic of our research. But uh, I thought I'd, uh, when I was preparing this lecture, it just struck me that actually it was about 25 years ago, I, I did my doctorate at Harvard Law School, and uh, I remember uh, my thesis was actually on almost something very similar to this very topic. So there is quite a link with, uh, in a sense, your thesis topic never ever really lets you go. Uh, I struggled with this topic. In fact, when I wrote it in the United States, I did a comparative uh, study on the United States and Canada and Australia. But even then, writing about whether Australia should have a Bill of Rights, I really felt as though I was writing for a very, very small audience. And in fact, my American supervisor, who was a very famous uh, American constitutional lawyer, um, he, uh, he once told me that the American Constitution was the finest document ever written anywhere by anyone, so it shows you how devoted he was to it. Uh, when I told him that Australia didn't have a Bill of Rights, uh, I don't think he really believed me at first. He kept sort of thinking I, there must be one somewhere. Um, but uh, So writing my thesis was actually quite lonely because 25 years ago the questions that I was looking at didn't seem to attract anybody's interest much. Certainly not, didn't attract the interest much of my supervisor, although that's another story, but it didn't uh, seem to attract anybody else's interest. And I did end up feeling I'd become immersed in a rather marginal topic. So that said, it's been really fascinating for me to see this issue, whether Australia should have a Bill of Rights or not, uh, creeping back slowly onto Australia's national agenda. Uh, Trevor actually just told me he'd heard on the news this morning uh, the Prime Minister uh, making the point, you, you probably realise today is the day that the Prime Minister is uh, announcing the government's responses to the 2020 summit held almost exactly a year ago. And one of the proposals, one of the many, many proposals that came out of the uh, 2020 summit last year was that Australia should have a Bill of Rights. And uh, Kevin Rudd, in his response, he was able to sort of give a bit of a tick to that because in December last year, the Australian government appointed an expert committee to consider uh, this question also, although to be technical, the committee has actually just been asked to consider how adequate human rights protection is in Australia. That committee is chaired by uh, Father Frank Brennan, uh, a very well-known uh, lawyer, uh, human rights lawyer and Jesuit priest, and its other members are Mary Kostakidis, the former SBS uh, newsreader, uh, Mick Palmer, the former head of the Australian Federal Police, and the fourth member is a Queensland barrister, a young Indigenous woman called Tammy Williams. So after, uh, it seems, 25 years of solitude on this issue, not exactly, but almost, uh, the debate now is in full flower because of the Brennan Committee's work, and that committee is due to report in August this year. Now, because it's very much on the top of many legal agendas, uh, I've been struck by the fact that newspaper columnists are now also paying a lot of attention to this issue, and you can see um, almost any newspaper you open, there are going to be debates on it, the pros and cons of whether an Australia should have a Bill of Rights. And you can see some very, very polarised positions developing. So the, Australia, the, uh, the Australian newspaper, the Murdoch-owned press, I think you could say, is bitterly against such a proposal. Uh, the Australian newspapers had a number of major editorials. Uh, all their columnists, I haven't found one of their columnists yet who, uh, who support the idea, but they're regular columnists. And yet, on the other hand, uh, there have been some very, very strong voices in favour of it. For example, I caught, I think on Sunday on ABC National Radio, a speech by the uh, very well-known Australian lawyer, Geoffrey Robertson, who's just published a book called The Statute of Liberty, and he was giving a major speech on that, giving very, very strong support uh, to the idea. So the point is, uh, passions run very, very high on this topic, uh, with advocates of a Bill of Rights on the one hand arguing that it's vital to secure human rights in Australia, and critics uh, fearing that a Bill of Rights is going to replace democracy in Australia, that it's somehow going to undermine Australian democracy as we know and love it. So to, what I want to do today is to, first of all, briefly survey the history of Australian debates about, about Bills of Rights, 
and then look at some of the arguments for and against uh, a Bill of Rights, focusing on the major critique, uh, the critique that a Bill of Rights will undermine Australian democracy. Well, does Australia need a Bill of Rights? Certainly our founding fathers, and they were all fathers, all men, uh, the drafters of the Australian Constitution uh, over 100 years ago, certainly they thought Australia didn't need one. It's quite interesting and, and not a well-known part of Australian history that during the 1890s, when the Constitution was being drafted, there was actually a proposal put on the table by the Tasmanian Attorney General, a very interesting man called Andrew Inglis Clark. And he had been very influenced by his uh, correspondence with the great American jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, Inglis Clark had traveled in the United States. He was very taken with the American legal system. And so he proposed to the Australian drafters, of which he was one, look, there should be some rights included in the Australian Constitution. Uh, so he included, for example, the right to a jury trial, uh, the right to the privileges and immunities of state citizenship, uh, the right to uh, the protection and freedom of religion, and the right to equal protection under the law. So that was a distillation of some of the rights in the American Bill of Rights. But what's striking is when you comb through the constitutional debates in the 1890s, uh, those ideas were largely rejected. And uh, although some of those rights do survive in a very, very limited form in the Australian Constitution, for example, the right to a jury trial is contained in the Australian Constitution, but in an exceptionally limited way. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that you have a right to a jury trial only if you're tried on indictment, which is a legal technical term, uh, for a Commonwealth offence. So if you are unlucky enough to be charged under state law for an offence, for example, you would have no right to a jury trial in Australia. So the right to a jury trial that's contained in our constitution is extremely limited. But the really interesting debate at the constitutional conventions in the 1890s was over the equal protection clause that Inglis Clark had, had proposed. And uh, this was roundly rejected. It was uh, rejected almost by all the drafters. And one of the major reasons why our constitutional framers did not want to include a right to equal protection of the laws in our constitution was because they said, this will cause trouble for the states who want to exclude Asian and African minors, people coming into uh, uh, work in the various mines in Australia. So there was a real fear that if we guaranteed equal protection under the law, that this would mean that the states uh, would be restricted in their right to freely discriminate against any races that they didn't want to include in Australia. So it's worth bearing in mind that the constitutional drafters, that was one of their major motives. They also, and there are some wonderful quotes in the convention debates, they also said things like, well, of course, we'll be a society of civilised men, and there is our parliament will be full of civilised men, and there is no way that civilised men will ever breach anybody's human rights. There was this complete confidence in the Australian Parliament. Uh, another reason why the Australian drafters rejected the idea of any Bill of Rights for Australia was the sense was Australia had become independent peacefully, that it wasn't they. They compared the American Revolution and said, well, the Americans, of course, had to include the Bill of Rights in their constitution because they were born out of conflict, out of revolution, whereas we're a peaceful nation and if you like, a Bill of Rights is a sign that something is wrong in society. Only societies where there are really big problems are going to be worried about Bills of Rights. Well, I'm going to then zoom over 70 years of history because there was really not much attention paid to the issue of whether Australia needed a Bill of Rights or not until uh, the 1970s. And those of you, and there aren't very many of you, I think, in the audience who are old enough to remember the Whitlam years uh, may remember that the, the, the brief period of government, the, of, of the first period of Gough Whitlam's uh, period of government, he was elected, of course, in late 1972, uh, his attorney, attorney general was a, quite a crusading figure, Lionel Murphy, whose name is now on a number of buildings and scholarships. And, uh, uh, but Lionel Murphy was very committed to introducing an Australian Bill of Rights. So in the 1970s, as Attorney General, he then went on to serve as a member of the High Court. But he introduced Australia's first Bill of Rights into the federal parliament. And this was a very interesting document. It was based on Australia's international treaty commitments. Uh, he introduced it into parliament, and then all hell broke loose. Everybody hated it. The Labor Party hated it. The Liberals hated it. The National Party, or their uh, precursors, 
really were worried about it. And the, the main arguments uh, that were used to down the Murphy Bill, it really disappeared very, very quickly. Uh, one of the main arguments was the effect that a federal Bill of Rights, an Australian Bill of Rights, would have on the states. And uh, this argument was led by Joe Bielke Peterson, who was then uh, the Premier of Queensland. And he made the argument, to a human rights lawyer it's a nonsensical argument, but his argument was if the federal government uh, has a National Bill of Rights, that will constrain the states from freely discriminating against their own citizens. It's a state's right not to be bound in any way uh, by discrimination laws. So that argument, although it sounds bizarre, that it was states' rights pitted against human rights, uh, won the day. Uh, many of the states, even the Labor states, came on board and said, yes, yes, this will be terrible. This will undermine Australian federalism. So the argument that sort of knocked off the Bill of Rights proposal in the 1970s was, by and large, effectively the argument of, of states' rights. Uh, then we go to the 1980s, and in the 1980s, uh, during the Hawke government, uh, there were two further attempts to introduce bills of rights into Australia. One was led by Gareth Evans, uh, the other was led by uh, Attorney General Lionel Bowen. These were actually much less ambitious than Lionel Murphy's model, but they also sank very, very quickly. And the reason they sank again, the spectre of states' rights was raised, but this time it wasn't a conservative Queenslander raising the problem. It was actually one of the Labor Party's own people. It was Brian Burke from WA, the, the, the Premier in WA, who's since been in the news in all the corruption inquiries. So you can see they're very fine people, these characters. Um, and he argued very, very strongly and managed to convince Bob Hawke uh, uh, not to push ahead with any Australian Bill of Rights. So those, those uh, attempts died off. And then there was one last attempt uh, in the late 1980s, 1988, uh, and this was actually an attempt uh, to alter the constitution. And uh, there was a, a, a referendum in, in 1988 and a number of issues were up, but the relevant ones to rights were attempts to extend the very minimal protections that are in the constitution to do with rights, for example, the right to a jury trial, to extend those from not just binding the federal government to also bind the states. So, for example, the right to a jury trial that I've already mentioned that affects you if you're charged on indictment with a Commonwealth offence would, had this amendment been successful to the Constitution, also uh, covered you if you were charged under state law. However, that referendum was roundly lost. In fact, Peter Reith, uh, a politician, some of you may remember, as he was in opposition then, really made his, his mark, if you like, as a politician by leading the coalition government's attack on those referendum uh, proposals. And one of my early memories is a very nervous young academic was actually, I had to face Peter Reith in a debate on these referendum uh, procedures. And I went along, as every academic does, with sheaves of notes and with so many citations to legal authorities. And I just thought I'd just covered everything. I was so very nervous. And um, he just swept in without a note and just said, look, you've got a choice between an ivory academic you know, ivory tower academic or me, you know, a grassroots politician, who do you believe? And believe me, everybody believed him and they certainly didn't believe me. So um, that was my minor vignette in that debate, but, but I'm sure that didn't affect the overall vote. It, it lost catastrophically. So the story is, uh, thus far, should Australia have a Bill of Rights until this year, you might say, uh, the debate has been a very one-sided one because any attempt to actually propose a Bill of Rights in Australia has been roundly lost. Uh, now, the main, in, in the more recent years, when there has been talk of, well, should we have a Bill of Rights? For example, when this issue came up last year at the 2020 summit, the main argument that's now put forward is not that of states' rights. That argument seems to have actually slipped away. The main argument that you hear today, and you can open the Australian almost any day of the week to read this argument, is that, uh, a Bill of Rights will shift power from the elected government of the day to an unelected judiciary, and therefore it's undemocratic. So this is the major argument, it's the argument I want to focus on, because that's the one that's put most commonly. So the idea is that the notion of parliamentary sovereignty, which we inherited from the United Kingdom, 
and the tradition of responsible government. Uh, so for those of you who may not have been brought up on these concepts, the idea is, well, we, we elect all our parliamentarians. Our executive government is drawn from the parliament. Unlike, say, the United States, where Barack Obama can choose as his Secretary of Commerce or Secretary of anything, or his executive does not, do not need to be elected. In fact, they cannot be elected officials. Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, has to stand down as an elected, uh, as, as a member of the Senate. In Australia, uh, our system of parliament means that with so-called responsible government means the executive, all of our ministers, are also members of parliament and they can be called to account directly by parliament. So the idea is, the theory is, we have responsible government because our ministry, our executive, is directly accountable to the elected House of Parliament. Indeed, they're part of the elected House of Parliament. Uh, so the idea is uh, that the executive branch of government will not go off and violate human rights or do crazy things. They'll be held in check by the power of Parliament. So one of the really strong proponents of this, of, of this argument is actually uh, the former New South Wales Labor Premier, Bob Carr. And he's made this argument time and time again. And I just want to quote to you from a speech of his. And this, I think, is a very well articulated expression of the argument, uh, parliaments are the right place to deal with human rights. Here's what Bob Carr said. Parliaments are elected to make laws. In doing so, they make judgments about how the rights and interests of the public should be balanced. If the decision is unacceptable, the community can make its views known at regular elections. This, he said, is our political tradition. A Bill of Rights, however, would pose a fundamental shift in that tradition, with the Parliament abdicating its important policy-making functions to the judiciary. A Bill of Rights, he said, is an admission of the failure of Parliaments, governments and the people to behave in a responsible, reasonable and respectful manner. I do not believe we have failed. So appealing to the Australian tradition of allowing the parliament to make the tough decisions and then the parliament at elections to face the music. If the electorate doesn't like what they've done, if they've violated human rights, the electorate will call to them to account. That I think, I hope I've put it fairly because I'm going to disagree with it, but that I think is the essence of Bob Carr's position. He's not the only one. There are many other people who make that argument. Prime Minister Howard, uh, in a number of speeches, he always used to say, we don't need an Australian Bill of Rights because we have robust parliamentary debate. So he's making a similar argument, I take it, to Bob Carr, and interesting because they're, from, of course, from two different sides of the political spectrum, both saying, leave it to parliament. This is where human rights are best protected. But it seems to me one only just has to scratch the surface a bit. One only has to make a trip up to parliament, uh, which is well worth doing, uh, I think, for us all regularly, those of us who live in Canberra. That very, very rosy view of Australian parliamentary practice seems to me has very little evidence to support it. Faith that elected governments will always be vigilant on human rights issues is simply not borne out in practice. Indeed, what we find is that far from there being robust political debate, we actually find that the major political parties are typically in agreement on the groups whose freedoms need to be restricted. There's common convergence on the groups that are problems and we often find complete complete support from both sides of parliament. So to take, for example, Australian uh, legislatures have uh, enacted laws that allow mandatory sentencing of children. This was done in the Northern Territory in Western Australia. Uh, laws that effectively discriminate against applicants for refugee status on the basis of race. Uh, these laws are very much in the news, of course, at the moment. And uh, laws allowing indefinite attention of asylum seekers. But perhaps the most recent and the best example of the failure of parliamentary scrutiny to protect human rights is the anti-terrorism legislation that's been introduced in the early part of this century, which has been introduced with almost no concern for human rights. For example, if we just take one piece of that legislation, the 2005 anti-terror laws that were introduced by the Commonwealth, they contain a number of mechanisms such as preventative detention, control orders, very, very broad definitions of what is sedition that, to me, clearly violate international human rights standards, particularly the right not to be arbitrarily detained, uh, the right to a fair trial, and the right to freedom of speech. 
Now, if you go back and say, well, what happened in Parliament during the time that those, uh, those <coughs> bills were being debated? Was there robust parliamentary debate? You see there was debate coming from some of the minor parties, but effectively both Labor and the coalition parties agreed that the category of suspected terrorists, not people who were found to be terrorists, but people that were lumped under the umbrella of suspected terrorists, both sides of politics agreed that this was a group that didn't deserve full human rights protection. And suspicion could be on, on relatively flimsy grounds. So those examples, I think, uh, illustrate nicely many of the problems inherent in our current system for protecting human rights in Australia. Because there are very, very few limits on legislative power of our federal parliament, it's possible for our democratically elected representatives to act to breach human rights without effective scrutiny, almost without scrutiny at all. Minorities are most at risk of human rights breaches. Uh, so it's always going to be groups that form a minority in society. And for that reason, the thought that the electorate is going to jump up and down to protect the rights of a minority at the next election is certainly not borne out in practice and seems to me to be highly unlikely because it's often, uh, many Australians probably thought, yes, anybody who might possibly be a terrorist uh, doesn't deserve human rights. So in a sense, uh, there's no constituency for the protection of human rights in our current system. Now, that's sort of the bad news story about Australia and human rights. But I should just note before I go on that Australia, on the other hand, internationally, has been a very, very active player in accepting international human rights treaties. So we are, uh, if you like, Jameis faced. We're very, very good at looking to the international community and saying, yes, 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 we're going to sign up to a whole range of international treaties. So we've accepted almost all the major human rights treaties, the covenants on civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, treaties on discrimination on the basis of race, on the basis of sex, the convention on the rights of the child. We've recently, just last year, signed up to the most recent UN Convention on the Protection of the Rights of Persons with a Disability. So we're very, very good at accepting international human rights obligations. Where we are much less good is actually making those treaties bite in Australian law, actually giving them some presence uh, in our law. And uh, I think that it's very easy to see a whole range of Australian laws that are inconsistent with our international treaty obligations. So if one were a Martian and measuring Australia's human rights performance simply by going down and checking how many treaties have they become a party to, Australia would measure up very, very well. But if, on the other hand, you're coming from a bottom-up perspective and say how many of these treaties are actually reflect in Australian law, I think you would find we do very, very badly. And the laws that we have, for example, the Racial Discrimination Act, the Commonwealth Government has acted on a number of occasions to actually suspend that legislation. So most controversially, that legislation has been suspended uh, in the context of the Northern Territory intervention. The Federal Government announced we're going to intervene in the Northern Territory, but we are suspending the operation of the Racial Discrimination Act for the duration of the uh, intervention. So I think it's fair to say that human rights haven't been a large part of Australian public life. And for that reason, I've it's no surprise, I think, to uh, say that I would answer uh, the question, the rhetorical question I've posed here uh, in the affirmative. Now, the reasons why uh, I, I think that uh, Australia does need a Bill of Rights is uh, based on the evidence of how Bills of Rights have operated in other jurisdictions besides the federal Australian one. And it really strikes me that opposition to Bills of Rights uh, really rests on fears of undermining democracy in the abstract without any evidence to back it up. So people, for example, Janet Albrechtson, the uh, Australian columnist two weeks ago, um, accused a number of people in favour of Bill of Rights, in including me, uh, I must admit, she, she had a heading saying proponents of Bills of Rights are liars. It's quite a, quite a strong headline and went on to accuse people who argued in favour of Bills of Rights for lying. And her basis for saying that was um, they, proponents of Bills of Rights, underestimate the threat to democracy and they're lulling Australians into giving away uh, Australian democracy in, in all its glory. But it seems to me, had she actually looked at how Bills of Rights 
had worked in particular situations, she would not have been able to make that claim. Well, let me tell you where our data on such a question might come from. We have here in the ACT, actually Australia's first Bill of Rights, the Human Rights Act. Uh, so in our little jurisdiction here, we have uh, a Human Rights Act. The state of Victoria has the Victorian Charter of Rights and Responsibilities, uh, which came into force in 2006. So we actually have some examples of bills of rights already operating in Australia. But we have much longer lived bills of rights uh, operating in the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom Human Rights Act, and the New Zealand Bill of Rights, 1990. Now, I mentioned those bills of rights. I'm not referring to the United States one yet, because those types of bills of rights, the ACT, the Victorian, the United Kingdom, the New Zealand one, are all statutory bills of rights in the sense that they are passed by an act of parliament. They're not contained in a constitution. So they're quite distinct from the United States Bill of Rights or the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms of 1982. So when I refer to bills of rights from now on, I'm referring to this statutory model, a bill of rights that's adopted by an ordinary majority of parliament and which can be repealed uh, by another parliament. Now, uh, the point about these bills of rights is that they do not allow judges, the judiciary, to invalidate laws, to strike down laws as inconsistent with human rights. Rather, all these sorts of bills of rights depend on what's been called a dialogue model of human rights protection. And this is how the idea of dialogue works. The, the theory of dialogue uh, is that you've got the three arms of government, you've got the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. And the idea of these laws is to ensure that all the branches of government consider human rights in their decision making. So first of all, how, how, how does this actually work? All those laws contain a provision that says all laws adopted in this jurisdiction must be interpreted as far as possible to be consistent with human rights. So you have a provision that says every law should be read to be as consistent as far as possible with human rights. Well, that's as good as far as it goes, but what about a law that clearly on its face violates human rights? Well, all these laws say if there is a law, for example, if the Legislative Assembly, the ACT, said all redhead people must be detained for 30 days, so a law that's clearly discriminatory on its face, clearly violating human rights, the right to freedom of movement, the right not to be discriminated against, if the Legislative Assembly decided in its wisdom to pass such a law, it's fairly clearly in violation of human rights, very hard to interpret that law to be consistent with human rights. So uh, the ACT Human Rights Act, for example, allows then a court to make what's called a declaration of incompatibility, a formal statement by the judiciary not invalidating the law, but saying that the law is incons in inconsistent with human rights. And the idea is that if you have the various branches of government discussing human rights, there will, this will generate political pressure on the legislature no government, no legislature wants to have the judiciary saying, legislature, your latest law is inconsistent with human rights. So this dialogue model of human rights rests, if you like, on the power of publicity, on the power of making public breaches of human rights. And if judges are able to make this formal statement, this will add to the political pressure on governments to be uh, consistent uh, with human rights. But the important aspect of this model is, at the end of the day, if a government does want to violate human rights, a legislature, it can do so. The only thing is, it has to do so in the light of publicity. Now, one complaint about these type of Bill of Rights from supporters of Bills of Rights is that they're too weak, because in the end, uh, a legislature can in fact pass a law that's inconsistent with human rights. I think some years ago I would have agreed with that argument. I would have thought, yes, the only way to really protect human rights is to include them in a constitution where they're protected and where any law inconsistent with them will be found to be automatically invalid. But I've really changed my mind on that and I think that, uh, and I'm happy to discuss some of those reasons in, in, in question time, but I actually now think that it's much more fruitful to the protection of human rights to have this dialogue between the executive, the legislature and the judiciary to create a political pressure 
to support human rights rather than having the possibility of a judiciary striking down laws that aren't consistent with human rights. And the idea of a dialogue model is that we shouldn't get a whole lot of high profile court cases. In fact, what you're trying to do with a dialogue model is to improve human rights performance at the level of policy when it's being dreamed up and the level of practice at the grassroots level. Uh, the idea is governments, before they even have take a policy idea to the legislative stage, should really think through the human rights consequences of what they're doing. And what's really striking, we here at the ANU, with the group that I'm working with, we've done now a five-year research project watching how the ACT Human Rights Act is actually operating in practice. And what's quite striking from our research is that the major effect of the Human Rights Act has been inside government. There haven't been a whole lot of high profile cases uh, involving human rights claims in, in, in the courts. For example, there have been a range of human rights proposals that have either been killed off, they haven't seen the light of day, uh, because somebody inside government has said, hang on, before this goes to the next step, we have to examine whether this policy is consistent with human rights obligations. And I understand from some of our research that, for example, there was a proposal by one politician that headscarves should be banned in all ACT primary schools. A fairly extraordinary proposal, but luckily somebody said when this proposal was put up by a politician, they pointed out, well, actually, hang on, before we start talking about any moves on this, you would have to make a great human rights argument that that is consistent with human rights, and that policy proposal was dropped. The new ACT prison, which opened a couple of weeks ago, was very interesting because one of the uh, instructions to the architect in the uh, brief to the architect was to make the new ACT prison as consistent as possible with international human rights standards, which meant, for example, that one of the rooms at the prison uh, is a worship room to allow people to pursue their right to freedom of religion in the context of a prison. This has been a huge issue. For example, in New South Wales prisons until recently, any religious object was banned from prison cells, which seems to me to be a real human rights issue. But here at the ACT, there's been a real attempt, a very serious attempt made, to actually, if you like, bring architecture into, uh, into line with human rights, to try and build a building that actually is going to make the human rights of prisoners uh, much more easy uh, to observe. And again, another example is the, Commonwealth, the ACT's anti-terrorism laws. The ACT uh, agreed to adopt anti-terror laws in 2005 um, at the same time that the Commonwealth did, but the comparison between the two sets of laws is, 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 is very striking. For example, uh, the ACT version of the anti-terror laws um, uh, excludes children from preventative detention, which is something possible under the uh, Commonwealth laws. And it also, for example, uh, omits the draconian criminal penalties under the Commonwealth laws that uh, if, if you'd been detained under the Commonwealth anti-terror laws and you told somebody that you'd been detained under them, uh, you, in turn, that was a separate criminal offence. And there was five years jail for actually saying that you had been detained. So the ACT version of the laws omits that. That's just one example of the way where human rights has had a real effect on that. Um, another example of the impact of the Human Rights Act here in the ACT is um, the fact that, for example, under former ACT law, it was possible to strip search detained children. If children were detained on suspicion of criminal activity, they could be actually strip search under ACT criminal laws. And uh, this has been abolished now uh, under, under new laws because of the Human Rights Act. But to take some examples uh, from other jurisdictions, uh, for example, what we actually see, the effect of this legislation, as I've said, in cases where it's being used, is not so much in the courts. It's actually on the ground in daily practices. And where you find it having the greatest effect is to, in areas that deal in blanket policies. And one area of life which tends to deal in blanket policies is actually nursing homes. None of you yet may have had a lot of experience of nursing homes, but it's extraordinary if you look at this field how many rules there are. They're absolutely intransigent rules. And the Human Rights Act has been used, for example, in the United Kingdom in a whole range of areas to soften, if you like, the effect of these very rigid draconian rules. Um, 
so, for example, in, 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 a, in a care context, a woman with a disability who is confined to her bed um, in London requested a special bed so that her carers could lift her for baths. And uh, the council was going to pay for that, but she said, well, look, can I have a double bed because I'm still married and I want my husband uh, to share it? And the local council said, no, we will not give you a special bed for two people. We're only going to give you a special bed for one person. She said, well, I'll pay the difference. And they said, no, that's not in our policy. And luckily, she consulted somebody who went along and said to the council, look, there's a Human Rights Act that protects the right to family life. And what you are doing with your blanket policies is making it impossible for this woman to have a family life. And that, that changed the policy. Uh, there was another example of uh, a couple uh, in Victoria who'd been married for 60, I think it was 65 years, an incredibly long time. And they were separated when the husband was admitted to a residential uh, care facility. And his wife would say, well, you can't live with him because you yourself don't fit the criteria to move into this particular facility. Uh, which seemed incredibly cruel, and that was just said, no, sorry, that's our policy, you cannot do this. And again, human rights arguments were used in that case with local government to say, look, this is completely inconsistent with human rights. And there was no court case involved, they simply changed uh, their policies straight away. <coughs> so uh, it seems then that the evidence that we have after 10 years of the United Kingdom legislation, mm -hmm. after five years of the ACT legislation, and three years of the Victorian legislation, that these instruments are making a difference on the ground. So in closing then, let me reflect on the value of research, um, the enterprise that people who are coming along to talks at Research Fest probably think about a lot. Now, I don't want to go so far as to suggest that all critics of bills of rights operate in a research-free zone. Indeed, there are a number of very impressive and able critics uh, of bills of rights who clearly do research. And two, two, two of the major opponents of bills of rights are colleagues here at the ANU, Professor Tom Campbell and Professor John McMillan, who's currently the Commonwealth Ombudsman. But, so I'm not making that blanket claim, but I do think that opposition to bills of rights is overall characterised by emotion and fixed positions that are not affected by the evidence of how bills of rights actually operate in practice. Most critics operate, uh, focus completely on the United States Bill of Rights, and they often draw their examples from lawyer shows on television about the extremities of bills of rights. Uh, and though that type of constitutional Bill of Rights is quite different from the statutory Bill of Rights I've been talking about here, I think these critics do not search out the facts and the evidence and analyse and evaluate them. Perhaps if they had PhDs from the ANU, they might be more likely to do so. But what I've argued is that in Australia's current political system, a statutory Bill of Rights would be likely to improve the quality of our democracy by requiring human rights standards to be taken into account in government and public actions and policy. I'm not suggesting it would be a panacea for all human rights violations, but I think it would be likely to make violations more obvious and subject to scrutiny. I think, and I'm quoting here a colleague at the University of New South Wales, Andrew Lynch, he said that a Bill of Rights compels politicians and governmental officials to lift their game by making them squarely consider the impact of proposed policies on laws and human rights. In that sense, they promote political accountability and respect for people beyond the role at the ballot box every few years. So a Bill of Rights can be understood as antithetical to Australian democracy only if we're operating with a very, very narrow understanding of what democracy is, that it simply means the majority rules, unconstrained by protection for minority interests. So I want to urge a richer understanding of democracy that involves acknowledging that there are some rights that are so essential to human dignity that legislatures should be required to think twice before they tamper with them. A Bill of Rights wouldn't be, to take Bob Carr's phrase, an admission of failure of the legislative process, but I'd see it rather as a safety net to encourage government to act in ways that could elude them under the pressure of the moment. So in this context, I want to suggest a National Bill of Rights would enhance and support Australian democracy. It's an issue that deserves the broadest discussion and debate, not just by lawyers, but by the whole community.
that at the moment we have the best chance we've had in more than a generation. And that's because uh, there is this committee appointed, the Brennan Committee that I described before. And they, as you probably know, some of you who might be watching these things might be aware that the committee came through Canberra, I think, two or three weeks ago and held uh, a consultation here at, at the Convention Centre. I think they held two or three and they've also been in Queanbeyan. Uh, we don't know what that committee is going to propose. We do know that they're doing their job extremely thoroughly because they're travelling the length and breadth of Australia and their remit from the government is to hear what are Australians saying. And I understand from the press that they've received over 10,000 submissions, which is an extraordinary uh, number of submissions. Uh, so a lot will depend on what the Brennan Committee comes up with. Then there's another step because, as Frank Brennan said recently at a, at a public lecture here, it's not necessarily clear that whatever that committee suggests, the government will necessarily take it up. Because we know that within the Labor government, uh, within federal parliament, that there are a number of uh, right sceptics, if I can call them that. There'd be an, a, a significant number of parliamentarians who would share Bob Carr's fears about an undermining Australian democracy. I think our Attorney General, Robert McClelland, is very much in favour of it, but uh, my sense is that he certainly, that there's not a big majority. So I think this year is going to be an extremely interesting one uh, for, for this issue, but uh, if I were a betting person, uh, I'm an optimist. <laughs> so I'd probably put some money on us having something, uh, but it may not be something even quite like the dialogue model that, that I proposed yet. Frank Brennan, one of the reasons uh, he was appointed famously, this was said at the time, was because he's given a number of speeches where he said he's a fence sitter on the issue of human rights. And uh, he's very proud of the fact that he has never stated a firm position. He has written a book very, very critical of the American Bill of Rights, but it'll be extremely interesting. He's keeping his cards very, very close to his chest, so you can read all his public statements, but. They don't, they don't tend to give anything away. So I, I, I would put it you know, two to one that we'll get that something. As you've intimated, the, whether, we, whether we get a Bill of Rights and whether it's maintained across government really is completely dependent, at least your model, uh, not your model, but the model that you favour, uh, on the politicians themselves. Uh, and and so then we, we bring in this behavioural thing where uh, many individual people, be they politicians or not, really don't uh, favour the outside interference. Uh, they would, their, their minds aren't uh, looking at the universe, if you like, they're looking at <coughs> control. Uh, and they, uh, it seems to me, are the naysayers as far as the Bill of Rights go. So, so your suggestion is that, uh, I just sort of make sure I completely understand your point, it, it was that the critics are people who are fearful of politicians' control or, or no, have the, 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 the politicians themselves. Yes, oh I see, sorry, uh, sorry, I take your point, sorry. You yeah. know, there are, uh, it, it, it's almost a behavioural thing, yeah. uh, this, this area of the people that are uh, object to it. But in addition, as far as I can understand, the politicians that are objecting too are, are the politicians that uh, tend to like control. Uh, in other words, they don't like people interfering from the outside. Oh, sorry, and yes. uh, as you described it, even your model or the model you're supporting, uh, in effect, there's an outside influence yeah. because before the legislation uh, gets accepted, uh, they have to do another check. Or oh, does this fit uh, human rights standards? No, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your point initially. You're absolutely right. And I think that, uh, of course, this does place constraints on policymakers and legislatures, yes. Uh, because it will, it adds another thing to throw into the mix, apart from everything else is, you know, is this going to get through Parliament, have we got the numbers, have we got this? You would have to consider, 
and is it compatible with human rights? And sometimes when you say, well, look, at the end of the day, the legislator can still go ahead and pass legislation that breaches human rights, politicians say, yes, but then we would have so much publicity, it would be hard for us to do that. So they see this as a, as a constraint. You say, yes, that's exactly the point. But, um, and I think that's why in the federal parliament there is a lot of reluctance to have another set of limits on legislative power, whether they're formal or informal. And what's very striking is in the United Kingdom, whereas Tony Blair uh, and Jack Straw, who was uh, then the relevant minister, introduced the Human Rights Act in 1998 with a great deal of fanfare, this is terrific, you know, where Britain has got a new model of human rights protection, those same politicians are not so fond of the Human Rights Act today precisely because it's been used against them. It's been used to curb their power in many ways. And so um, I've noticed Bob Carr recently quoting a speech by Jack Straw, who sees himself as one of the architects of UK legislation, where Jack Straw sort of rues the day, that's perhaps putting a bit strongly, but saying, well, this has come back to bite us because we haven't been able to pass anti-terror laws exactly as we want them. We've had a whole lot of constraints on the way we pass legislation. So it's true, politicians are the least natural friends of such instruments. So your point is absolutely correct. Uh, yeah, I, um, um, I agree. It seems like there's a lot of resistance coming from the politicians in the parliament. But I'm just wondering what, what exists in our society which will convince politicians to change their views about human rights. I just noticed in the last couple of months that Amnesty um, in Australia went before the United Nations Committee seemingly provided enough embarrassment for the Australian government to change the views on the Racial Discrimination Act suspension and also a decision, a seemingly arose after that, associated with the Declaration on Indigenous Rights. It just seemed to me that um, those sort of potential embarrassments um, did work. But is that the way to go? Or are there other alternatives? Mm. Oh, I think it's a great question. I, I should say that you're, you're absolutely correct that Amnesty and another, a number of other groups, the, the best submission actually put to the UN Human Rights Committee was won actually by a coalition of legal groups uh, that put in a, an amazing sort of submission that the Human Rights Committee used. It's true that the, human rights, the UN Human Rights Committee did uh, single out the suspension of the Northern Territory, of the Racial Discrimination Act in the context of the Northern Territory. But as yet, we haven't heard, the government is still deciding what to do about that. I understand that an announcement on that is awaiting the visit of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People, James Anaya. So the government is maybe saving that up. But the government did. I think in place, the government had in place the acceptance of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I'm not clear whether that statement by the Human Rights Committee brought that pressure. But your point is a good one. Should we go the international route, for example, um, using the power of shaming and publicity to bring pressure? The trouble with those mechanisms is you only get to the UN Human Rights Committee if you're lucky every four or every five years. That's if the timetable's working, so it only comes up. You get half a day with the committee to put your views. I've read the committee's views on Australia and they are about five pages long and inevitably they are very broad brush and as the Australian government is very fond of pointing out, sometimes those committees get it quite wrong because they just don't understand the way things work in Australia and of course our government's very quick to say, you didn't understand this about Australian law. So it seems to me there's a real, I don't think we can rely, I see those as a valuable backup, but I don't think we can sort of outsource if it were to the international level scrutiny of Australia's human rights record uh, because of its irregularity, its cost, its inefficacy. So I'm, I really think it's critical. I think we need that as well, but I think it's critical to actually, to use the British phrase, bring, bring the rights home so that they actually bite in Australian courts and Australian legislatures. Uh, the, the members of the UN H Human Rights Committee also are famously often pilloried by our politicians. They'll say, oh, there's a Cuban on that committee and therefore the, you know, that, that committee has no uh, legitimacy at all. So it's quite easy, if you want to, to pick off those committees in terms of legitimacy. I don't think it's a fair criticism, but it's often done. Yeah. 
your dialogue model is very much based on publicity. What do you think about um, like trust to the media? If you if you see the mainstream media, if you, well, it's far from being interest free. So yeah, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, look, thank you for that question. I think. In Australia, where we haven't got a Bill of Rights, and I haven't, it's a very good point to make, because I haven't referred to the power of the media at all. And I think in Australia thus far, the media has actually been responsible for bringing publicity to a number of significant issues. And of course, when a particular journalist, often you find they're quite specialist journalists who really know the inside out situation and will sometimes bring issues you know, to public notice. And there have been a range of issues that none of us would know about. Uh, for example, the example I give of that is um, there was a series of articles, this is now over 10 years ago, about the effect of mandatory sentencing of children um, in the Northern Territory that brought to light cases such as you know, a child being jailed because they had for the third time stolen a chocolate bar from a local shop. These were all Indigenous children. And so that sort of thing wouldn't come into the public realm, it wouldn't come into parliament, we need the media. So I see the media as incredibly important. John Howard actually used to sometimes say, with robust parliamentary debate and the media, he'd sometimes bring the media in as human rights watchdogs, he'd say, how could we ever get away with serious human rights abuses in Australia because we've got this narky media who's always at us and they'll always call us to account. While I think the role of the media is very valuable, to me that doesn't substitute for the dialogue model because, first of all, it's only going to catch cases that attract a particular journalist's eye. You might be lucky to have a journalist who will take up your case and give it some publicity. But what about all the, I mean, the fact, for example, that in New South Wales jails it's been impossible to conduct a form of religious worship there. Where's the publicity for that? That's not a very attractive thing. Who's going to publish a series of articles about the rights of prisoners? You know, this is not something that's seen to be very attractive. Most people think prisoners shouldn't have human rights anyway. So it's all those things. I think the media only catches a very limited subset of human rights breaches. Very valuable ones, but it's not enough. So the dialogue model, when it works well, I'm not saying it always does, the idea of it is it's a much more thoroughgoing form of accounting for the way human rights are going to impact in particular, uh, in particular policies. And of course the other thing we know is that a lot of government policies and papers are kept very, very secret and they'll often only emerge years after the event. So it would be very, very difficult uh, to, I think, both be a journalist and to take on the right of full-time you know, human rights campaigner. Uh, but, uh, but I do want to really celebrate the role of the media in Australia for, in some cases, I think doing very brave and courageous work. Thank you very much. Could you please join us in the